Morning, everybody. Good morning, and uh, welcome to Carnegie. My name is Bill Burns, and I'm fortunate to be the president of the Carnegie Endowment, but I'm especially fortunate today to welcome home to Carnegie uh, my friend and former colleague, Rose Gottemuller. Uh, FOMO, the fear of missing out, is a condition that afflicts many in this town and in our profession. But I suspect that Rose was very glad to be on this side of the Atlantic when NATO leaders gathered in London earlier this week. And I have to say we're equally glad uh, to have the opportunity to hear and learn from one of the wisest policy voices and certainly one of the most decent human beings that I ever encountered in many years of public service. It took seven decades for NATO to appoint a woman as Deputy Secretary General, the Alliance's number two job. And if we've learned anything during Rose's remarkable three-year tenure, it might take another 70 to find anyone with her combination of skill, energy, leadership, and grit. I don't need to tell anyone here that NATO has had to navigate some stormy waters in recent years, and I think we've all been very lucky to have Rose helping to captain that ship. From managing a resurgent Russia and a very frail arms control regime to coming to grips with newer challenges like cyber, Rose has been an extraordinarily steadying force. And through her example and advocacy, Rose has also worked hard to promote diversity and inclusion in a profession that desperately lacks both. Today, we'll have the opportunity to get Rose's assessment of NATO and whether it can use this moment of crisis to adapt to a transformed international landscape. And we'll also get her assessment of where we are in arms control today and where we need to go if we're to avert a new arms race. After Rose's marks, uh, remarks, I'll moderate a very brief conversation just to get us started and then leave plenty of time for questions from the audience. So I want to thank you all again for coming today and ask you to join me in giving Rose Gottemuller a very warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be back on this stage. It's wonderful to be back at the Carnegie Endowment. Thank you very much, Bill, for this opportunity. And thank you for your warm words. I hadn't thought about FOMO with regard to the London meeting, but you're absolutely 100% right. Uh, I will start this morning by talking about the London meeting. I am going to start with Macron. It's inevitable there will be some questions about that. And then I will move on to talking about uh, where I think uh, we need to go with regard to particularly strategic arms reduction. Um, according to Macron, NATO um, was heading into the December 4 meeting in a brain dead state, a kind of zombie alliance. And I, I like that picture. In fact, there were apparently some very funny jokes around NATO headquarters of people kind of walking in a zombie way, just, just to me make it clear that there is a sense of humor at NATO as well. Um, his point, though, is that NATO is too attached to its old ways, too tied down by its old relationships, especially the transatlantic one, and NATO is seeing the world as it was and not as it is now, riven by terrorism, but not so menaced by nation states such as Russia. Macron likes Russia, or at least wants to open up to a more uh, wide-ranging dialogue with Russia. And uh, that has been something that, of course, uh, has been difficult uh, for NATO. I'll speak in a moment about the dual track dialogue plus deterrence and defense. But since the seizure of Crimea in 2014, of course, there has been uh, a constraint on NATO's react uh, relations with Russia. Uh, but leaving this meeting yesterday, all seemed satisfied that Macron had launched a useful debate. And in fact, that's an important point about all this. Macron himself said that he played the role of the icebreaker, crunching through the ice, making a lot of noise, but in the end, opening up water where uh, a good debate and discussion can take place. Um, you know, it's um, strange, though, in my mind that uh, the way he went about it in the early critique was to say that France was not consulted when the US president made his decision about withdrawing troops from Syria, and then the Turkish army was un unleashed in northeast Syria. To me, that's a strange assertion, because NATO never has and never will serve that purpose of being the entree, the general entree, for consultation on all matters of defense 
and security with the United States or with any of the other members. Uh, you know, allies consult among themselves on issues related to NATO business. Sometimes that's kind of loosely defined, but nevertheless, not on every issue affecting their national security. Frankly, also, I want to make the point that the U.S. consultation record at NATO has been rather good in the last year. There are two very good examples of that, I think. First, the consultation about uh, the 9M729, the Russian missile that is in violation of the INF Treaty. So the, uh, the consultation pre the demise of the INF Treaty was excellent and allowed individual NATO allies to themselves determine that Russia is in violation of the, of the INF Treaty. So that was a very good uh, consultative process that the US undertook. And second, uh, preparing for the peace process in Afghanistan. I note this morning that Ambassador Khalilzad is back in Kabul today. The peace process will again get going. The negotiations will still, uh, I know, take some time. But nevertheless, we are back to that point. And he consulted regularly in the run-up to August. I think we will see again Ambassador Khalizad being a regular visitor at NATO headquarters in Brussels. So while NATO is not designed for blanket consultations on all security issues, it is designed for providing security in the Euro-Atlantic space for its members. Here, Macron's comments were mixed. On the one hand, he seemed to call into a doubt the viability of the NATO security guarantee, Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. So I was very glad to see it reasserted in the final statement from the London meeting. Um, but on the other hand, he praised the operational ability of NATO to deliver on uh, those deterrence promises, underscoring the interoperability and operational effectiveness of the alliance. NATO, he said clearly, is working well in commanding operations. And that, to me, is NATO's bread and butter. That's what NATO is all about, providing true and tested ability to fight. And in that area, Macron was actually quite complimentary. That was little notice last week when all the furore was going on. So uh, I think it was fair to say that there was a vivid environment for discussion and debate entering into the London meeting. No doubt this situation, I think, is valuable for the alliance, since alliance strength is based on consensus in decision making, and that consensus can only be forged through discussion and debate. So as painful as achieving consensus can be, it is the only way. I suspect that this process being launched out of the London meeting will take some time. It's being talked about as a two-year process. But nevertheless, I think it will be effective in forging some new directions for the alliance, perhaps. But in the end of the day, I think it will come down to the results of uh, the Harmel report. Uh, these uh, conclusions were profound for the alliance back when France withdrew from the military uh, command structure of NATO in 1966. Belgian Foreign Minister Pierre Harmel and his colleagues to undertook a process um, to figure out what to do about NATO going forward. And in the end of the day, the process produced a very short and succinct report that we continue to live by today. The bottom line was the so-called two-track decision, the decision that was reiterated in the 2016 Warsaw Summit after a 20-year hiatus when uh, there were hopes of deeper cooperation between NATO and Russia. But the two-track decision focuses on the one hand on strong deterrence and defense, and on the other hand on dialogue and detente. I think this has been such a firm foundation for NATO to continue to work on over the years because it serves a profound purpose. As former Deputy Assistant Secretary Jamie Shea put it in a 2009 lecture, the dual track agreement or decision ensured that NATO's role was not simply to preserve the status quo, but ultimately to change it. And I think that is an important point. To my mind, that is NATO's greatest advantage, its adaptability. In other words, NATO will not stand still, but continue to adapt and change to respond to circumstances, political as well as military. Jens Stoltenberg, when he was preparing for the London's meeting, said in his 28 November press conference that he's wrestling with a paradox, and I've seen that every day in the office of the Secretary General. That is, while questions are being asked about the strength of the transatlantic bond, North America and Europe are doing more together than they have for many, 
many decades. Jens put it in a very amusing way yesterday when he said, I'm a politician. I'm used to good rhetoric and bad substance. In this case, we have bad rhetoric and great substance. So I thought that was a very, very telling comment from him, and it gets to the point that I wanted to underscore for you gets back to the point that Macron made about actually NATO doing well in leading operations. Where the rubber meets the road, where defense and security are concerned, NATO is doing its job. Now, I would like to uh, just say a few things about what, what I see as perhaps some less noticed results from this leaders' meeting. And it gets to, again, the substantive accomplishments. First of all, there is a real effort underway now to focus on readiness and reinforcement. After, again, the uh, move into Crimea by Russia in 2014, NATO took initial very important uh, decisions to do some quick reinforcement, but also to put the battle groups in place in the three Baltic states and Poland. Everyone recognizes they are but a tripwire. They are not the kind of force, if uh, it came to a long-range conflict, that could actually defend the allies. So the emphasis uh, since the battle groups, and uh, very much since our July meeting in 2018, has been on building up our ability to reinforce and on improving readiness. And so I think this NATO readiness initiative that was launched in Brussels in 2018 has been uh, very, very uh, promising in terms of, of what it helps to accomplish. Uh, just to recollect for you, it's 30 battalions, 30 air squadrons, and 30 combat ships ready in 30 days to participate in reinforcement activities if needed. Allies, by the time of this meeting in London, had already assigned about 90% of the units required, but they were able to fill in the gaps so that the NRI is now 100% filled and on its way to implementation. And I think this is very important. I'll come to it again in a moment, but all allies definitely recognize that they need to do more on readiness and they need to be better prepared for reinforcement. The second area, uh, less known perhaps, is that NATO is working on monitoring and surveillance abilities in a number of ways. The leaders in London agreed that space would be a new domain of operations, just as we've had air, sea, land, and cyber added to the domains of operations over the years. Over time, as NATO works with its member states to enhance space-based reconnaissance, NATO's ability to monitor for crises and conflict will increase. The first of NATO's new surveillance drones has just arrived in Sicily in uh, the last week or 10 days, and NATO has just signed a contract worth 1 billion US dollars to modernize the airborne warning and control system, the AWACS system. All of these initiatives will help NATO respond more quickly in crises and conflict. And finally, it has been a headline matter, and it has been since President Trump came to office, but investing more in defense has been at the top of the agenda it was for this meeting in London as well. But the point I want to stress for you is that it is critically tied to a wide-ranging recognition inside the alliance that, in fact, the allies, the NATO member states, have to address mass obsolescence, mass obsolescence and lack of readiness. Uh, the Warsaw Pact uh, era equipment in the hands of many of our newer allies in Central and Eastern Europe, I think, are a fine example of that. They need to modernize their equipment base. Therefore, it's for good reason that uh, Stoltenberg is advertising that NATO defense spending figures are showing a fifth consecutive year of growth with $130 billion invested since 2016. He is forecasting that the accumulated increase in defense spending by the end of 2024 will be $400 billion. Believe me, Jens is very careful about, uh, about calculating these numbers. They are numbers that the alliance can stand by. And they played well at the summit meeting. I do think that they contributed to a kind of uh, lower key President Trump than we've been accustomed to seeing at NATO meetings in, uh, in recent years. So um, in the end, the results of December 4th could not be determined from the outside. That's clearly the case. But I was glad to see that the planning that had gone on before my departure in mid-October, in fact, bore fruit. In addition to the points I mentioned, I will also just uh, make one final uh, emphasis on the agreement over China policy, where 
NATO has been, you know, for some time now, uh, engaged in military to military staff talks with China. We've also had a Paul Mill discussion going on, which I have led in recent years. But now it's been regularized, turning it into an, a, a regular meeting between our Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and the Director General of the, of the Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think this is a good thing, rather than the DSG meeting from time to time with the Chinese ambassador, it's a good thing to have a regularized palm mill discussion. So our interactions with China have been, I think, good in terms of uh, um, improving and increasing communication. But the thing I always want to emphasize uh, for every audience, including for our Chinese uh, colleagues who ask all the time, you know, look at the name of NATO. It's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Our center of gravity is in the transatlantic space. We are not going to be shifting wholesale to China, but nevertheless, the implications of China's rise are important for the alliance in such things as military mobility. As uh, China buys up port facilities in Europe, for example, what, what implications are there for, for NATO? What do we need to be thinking about in terms of our ability to reinforce? And we're working very closely with the European <coughs> Union on issues of military mobility. So these are some of the things that have driven this policy review in NATO, but I'm very glad to see that it has come out looking um, very balanced in terms of being aware of the opportunities that China represents, but also the necessity of continuing to uh, look for the challenges, be aware of the challenges, and be wise about how the, rest, uh, the, uh, the relationship develops going forward. Now let me talk a bit about the nuclear arms control agenda, and in particular the New START Treaty, which I had the honor of working on with a great team of US negotiators. One message I wanted to begin by stressing is one that often gets lost in the debate, I think, and that is any arms control treaty, including the New START Treaty, is not a good in and by itself. It is only valuable insofar as it enhances US national security and the security of our allies. Arms control is not worth pursuing if it does not contribute to our security and indeed facilitate our ability to defend ourselves. In that way, arms control is a part of the spectrum of deterrence and defense, just as our capable conventional forces, strong nuclear forces, and reliable missile and air defenses. I know that a debate has been underway as to whether to extend the New START Treaty in, for five years from February 2021 to February 2026, as is permitted by the treaty. A number of arguments have been advanced against this step, including that the treaty does not control the new nuclear systems that Russian President Putin has announced, uh, and most prominently in a speech on March 1, 2018. Frankly, I don't find these arguments convincing in part because, in fact, New START can play a role in regulating these systems, and I'll say more about that in a few moments. But more importantly, we need to take a bald look at whether New START benefits U.S. national security and what blows to our security would accrue should New START go out of force on February 5, 2021. To me, the answer is clear. During the coming decade, the United States will be modernizing its nuclear forces. If the treaty is extended until 2026, it will continue to cap Russian deployed warheads at 1,550 and delivery systems, that is missiles and bombers, at 700, giving the United States a stable environment in which to modernize. Stable, and may I say predictable, predictable environment in which to modernize. Without that, that uh, treaty in force, that predictability and stability could go out the window, and fast. There is no faster way for the Russians to outrun us than to deploy more nuclear warheads on their missiles. This is not a new issue. Starting in the 1970s, the Soviets and now the Russians have built larger and heavier intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, on which they can load more warheads at will. They have plenty of them in storage. If released from the current 1,500 limit on deployed warheads, the Russians could, set, uh, could readily add several hundred more warheads, some say up to 1,000 warheads, to their existing deployments of ICBMs without deploying a single additional missile because of their ability to upload those missiles and do it fa uh, fairly rapidly. This would force the United States into a difficult targeting problem at best and a strategic crisis at worst. 
So we cannot afford to lose parity or stop regulating it. If New START lapses, that outcome could happen fast and outcome dangerous for our national security. Therefore, I underscore, and I believe it is in the national security interests of the United States to extend the New START Treaty to February of 2026. Such an extension will provide a stable environment both to modernize the U.S. nuclear triad and to negotiate a new strategic arms reduction treaty. Now, as I conclude, I'd like to mention that I am not uh, at all pessimistic about the future of arms control and limitation. We, have, we just have to be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Many today are saying that we have, we have run the course on traditional arms control. We've run out the string on traditional measures that control weapon hardware. Instead, they say we must confront the difficult, nay, unprecedented problems associated with cyber weapons, artificial intelligence, other new and emerging technologies. My point is we cannot afford to drop constraints on hardware and continuing to work to put in place new constraints on hardware. Missiles and nuclear warheads are plenty potent threats and will remain so. So while we look for ways to control and regulate new technologies, we must continue improving how we control and regulate existing hardware, especially nuclear hardware. Nuclear weapons remain the most potent weapons of mass destruction, and we cannot forget that fact. With that, uh, I'll look forward to our conversation, and thank you very much for this opportunity today. Thank you. Well, Rose, thank you very much for um, those characteristically thoughtful comments. Um, and I, I thought I'd start our conversation with just two or three questions, because I want to leave plenty of time for all of you and for your questions. We have until about 10.30 this morning. Um, but let me start with the London summit and, and NATO's future, and then we can turn to arms control and, and its future. Mm -hmm. um, if you set aside, just for a second, the imagery of brain death and zombie alliances, you've reassured me that there's still a sense of humor at NATO headquarters, which is Definitely. a good thing. Um, That's one of NATO's greatest strengths, is its sense of humor, I think. <laughs> little known needs and not it, recognized. Needs it these days in some respects. But um, it, clearly, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, today and also as you look at over the next few years. I mean, one of them is about uncertainty over the American role and uncertainty that's been deepened in a lot of ways in, in this era. But there's another concern as well that NATO, again, as you know better than anyone, is an alliance of liberal democracies. And you've got some NATO members today, whether it's Turkey most visibly, but also okay. Hungary and some other NATO members who are clearly um, going through a regression, to put it diplomatically, mm -hmm. um, in terms of commitment by their leaderships to the democratic values, which really are at the core of the alliance. How big a problem is that today, and how is the alliance going to manage that as you look ahead? It's a problem today, Bill, and it has been a problem in the past. And that is how I think about this issue. Every member of NATO signs up to the, uh, the basic principles in the Washington Treaty, which are related uh, to advancing the goals of liberal democracy and are powerfully stated. Uh, actually, the Washington Treaty, if you haven't read it lately, is a short and succinct document, but it, it powerfully states these principles. And so every nation who becomes a, a member of NATO must sign up to these principles. And in the run-up to membership, of course, as in the run-up to EU membership, they are, in many ways, uh, stress-tested on, on these, uh, their ability to live up to these principles. But uh, yes, it is clear there are uh, authoritarian developments in some uh, NATO, um, in some NATO countries, uh, moving away from what we would consider the, the uh, principles of, of uh, democratic practice. But I take a long view of this, and I look back to the past as well and consider uh, well, consider what happened after uh, the invasion of Cyprus by Turkey in 1974 and what that meant for Turkey being uh, shut out uh, in many ways. Again, uh, weapons uh, sanctions uh, against their purchase of weapons, these types of things going on. But uh, more in, in the same time period, the long um, reign of, uh, of Salazar in Portugal and what that meant 
for Portugal's participation in the alliance. And I always think that the alliance, by continuing, come what may, day in, day out, in our, uh, basically, our daily activities, how we continue to, um, to be proponents of these principles in how we work. And in the end of the day, it was colonels who had been working and engaged as NATO military staff or working at the Portuguese mission in NATO, but who had been every day so engaged in uh, advancing in everything we do. It's organic, you know, targeting, for example, thinking about how to plan a military op operation so as to target and av avoid civilian casualties. All of these kind of organic uh, methods that relate back to our, our principles in the Washington Treaty, they're part of the day in, day out life at NATO. And I feel like we need to continue to push those from the ground up at NATO. And we see historically, uh, I bring up Portugal because it's the uh, example that is most vivid of the flower revolution that took place in the early 1970s, bringing democracy back to Portugal. That was brought about by people who had been working at NATO, working in NATO, and really you know, had the opportunity to continue at NATO to develop, uh, to develop in that way. So I think it's, um, you know, it's just important to remind ourselves that we need to continue doing what we do and then uh, work with, um, with the different capitals if there are issues, if there are problems. The last thing I'll say about Turkey, though, is that Turkey is a very, very strong ally and is someone who is a, a country that is very engaged day in, day out on um, operations, military operations, whether in Afghanistan, uh, K-4, uh, whether in Iraq, they are very strong and um, uh, very good uh, participants in our operations. So coming back to military effectiveness, they are, they are really strong allies. Thanks, Rose. You, you talked in your opening remarks a bit about NATO's long-term strategy. And the last formal strategy adopted by NATO, I think, was a decade ago in 2010. Uh, lots happened since then, to understate the facts. Um, does it make sense to look to another, sort of to adapting another formal strategy now a decade later? Is that possible, given all the complications we've been talking about before? And if it made sense to try to do that, what do you think would be the most important innovations to try to focus on? Well, I'm interested to see uh, what <coughs> happens with this group that will be formed out of the London meeting, because I think it is possible they will be taking a good hard look, apparently, at NATO's strategic directions. So it is possible that their work could form the basis for a new strategic concept. Uh, we will see how it goes. Actually, I think NATO has been doing very well, again, focusing on the urgent issues that we have to address, such as being able to put in place very quickly the battle groups in uh, the uh, Baltic states and Poland, because we've had urgent, basically urgent issues to address, and it's been done in a very pragmatic and, I think, effective way. Uh, but it is also important then, and uh, that was an, uh, a major point that Macron was making, to think about the strategic directions of the organization. So I think we haven't, been, uh, we haven't been doing badly. We haven't been frozen in place. We have continued to adapt to new challenges. But indeed, the new challenges, uh, I think it, it makes sense to take a good hard look at what they mean for the alliance overall, uh, an area that I really uh, believe will be well, it's important to every military, but new and emerging technologies and where that is driving military uh, operations, military practice. So these things can be addressed on a kind of uh, pragmatic basis as the challenges arise, but I think it also makes sense to step back and take a, take a long look, take a good hard look, and in order to ensure that NATO is prepared to adapt and adapt uh, as, uh, as necessary. So. So we will see what, what happens, but uh, I mentioned new and emerging technologies. Clearly, we will continue to keep a sharp eye on what is going on uh, with the F Russian Federation. It is not inevitable, uh, and I'll be interested to see next week if there's any progress on the Normandy format, uh, if we see some, some progress in resolving the situation in the Donbass, that there could be some, some improvement in our interactions with Russia overall. We continue to emphasize the importance of dialogue and discussion with Russia. The NATO-Russia Council met 
met uh, 10 times, as I recollect, uh, in the years since 2016. So, so we do have a regular dialogue with the Russians, but there are perhaps some areas we could look further at. But for that to happen, Russia is going to need to, uh, to uh, show some progress on the road to returning to, as we call it, the, the world of international law and order. Uh, and that, I think, we'll have to see what, what Normandy brings, what the Normandy process brings, and the other processes that are going on in the Donbass. Rose, your, your mention of the enormous significance of emerging technologies on you know, NATO's future, but it obviously has a huge impact as well on the future of arms control, as you mentioned before. And so that kind of leads me to my last question, then I'll open it up to all of you. And that is, as you look at, you know, what my colleague at Carnegie, James Acton, has written eloquently about the entanglement of cyber, advanced conventional weapons, missile defense, a whole range of, you know, systems which are modernizing very quickly on traditional nuclear arms control, as you look ahead beyond the issue of New START, you made an eloquent case for the extension of New START. So if just for a moment, you assume that you know, we find a way with the Russians to extend New START, can you talk a little bit more about what the agenda for arms control ought to look like as we look at beyond a possible extension of New START over the next five or six years? How does it engage, how does it broaden the circle beyond the United States and Russia? to deal with enormously important players like China? How do we deal with some of the most significant nonproliferation challenges today, whether it's North Korea or Iran? How do all these, how do you see all these pieces fitting together as you look out over the next five or 10 years? Nice, easy question. Bill, this is a, <laughs> this is a day long seminar. <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, I see several directions that are important uh, to pursue. First of all, as I said at the podium a moment ago, let's not abandon the effort to continue to constrain existing hardware. And I, I fear sometimes mm -hmm. that's getting a little bit lost in the debate. Second, I think we need to uh, widen uh, the aperture in how we look at uh, handling these uh, less hardware-oriented uh, emerging and uh, new technologies. Uh, I think the role of, uh, of regulation, for example, as a starting measure will be very, very important in getting at uh, some of the cyber threats uh, that we are concerned about. And in the European Union, they've already begun, and there have been uh, moments of discontent, I know, with our own tech industries about efforts to, to regulate the cyber, uh, the cyber realm. And also, we need to be cautious because they're regulating it very well in Beijing indeed, and we need to be very cautious, again, about proceeding in an anti-democratic direction, uh, anti-free speech direction. We would not want to do that. But I think there is enough evidence out there about regulation being impactful in this world, that we should look about at how we can, we can begin perhaps to adapt it uh, to fit into the arms control agenda as well. The second area that I would emphasize, and I have been for a long time, I've spoken from this stage on that matter, we really need to up our game on how we handle monitoring and verification. We are still only equipping our, our inspectors with uh, yardsticks, pencil, and paper when they go in to do inspections. Of course, it's going to be difficult to negotiate because some uh, fears will always exist about the intrusiveness of, of technologies. But I do think that the, the potential uh, that has flowed from the information revolution will really help us to get at serious problems, such as problems of warhead verification. And so I urge uh, that as a, as a significant direction for uh, technology uh, development, but also for arms control policy development. How do we think uh, in that way? Now, the hardest problems have to do with uh, the countries that are outside the NPT regime or just hanging on its edge. Uh, Iran and North Korea are uh, the finest examples of that. We have proven that we can get at uh, the issues with the JCPOA, which I continue to support uh, very strongly. However, it is currently, as we know, in a, in a difficult, uh, parlous state, I would say. So I think in some ways it's a traditional diplomacy problem to figure out what, you know, what the interests are and the incentives are for Pyongyang and Tehran to participate in diplomatic uh, processes, and sometimes, yes, looking for ways to apply leverage on them, which the current administration has been, been trying to do. But uh, I guess I would argue for uh, looking 
a bit more at uh, incentives in addition to uh, the pressure tactics. And how about on North Korea, Rose? I mean, you know, it, it doesn't, just as an outsider looking at this, look especially likely that the current North Korean leadership is going to agree to a full denuclearization anytime soon. So, you know, how would you apply your experience and kind of, you know, arms control over many years to that problem? Does it make sense to look at kind of what we did with the Iranians and interim stuff that, you know, helps reduce, make more manageable, more easily to deter the problem? Is, is that also a mistake? Well, we have, two, uh, we have two challenges. We have many challenges with North Korea, but just in, in this space, I would say we have a problem of getting a handle on uh, intermediate range, uh, highly capable missile systems across Eurasia. It's not, it's not limited to North Korea. This is the issue that in some ways drove uh, the demise of the INF Treaty because the Russians over a decade ago decided that they were facing the proliferation of these missile systems in China, in South Asia, and elsewhere and became concerned about it. Why they didn't address this problem at the negotiating table, well, we should have a drink and a conversation about this sometime, but I've never figured out why they didn't try to address it at the negotiating table after Sergei Ivanov first raised the issue with Rumsfeld back uh, over a decade ago. But uh, I think we do need to think broadly. You asked me about how to get others involved in the process. This is the door, in my view, through which we go in order to get others involved in the process. I would start with China because they are a member of the P5. They are uh, members of the UN Security Council. They are interested in advancing the goals of the Nonproliferation Treaty, of which they are signatories. So I think there are, there are general big incentives for them, but I think there are also more focused incentives for them. That is getting a handle on proliferation that affects the most potent capabilities they have. These are the ground-launched intermediate range systems. Our armed forces, our Navy calls them the, the carrier killers, you know. So uh, from, from our perspective, we see them as a potent force. But the Chinese uh, are also facing a potent force or potent forces in future. And so they need to be thinking about, about how perhaps to exercise some general restraint in this area. So that's the door through which I'd go eventually also, maybe not too far down the road, to involve India and Pakistan for the interest of stability in South Asia. Uh, I, would focus, I would focus there. That also goes for North Korea. They have a, this bilateral effort in train now with the current administration. I don't know with, uh, with Mr. Began's uh, new position whether he'll continue to have much time to work that problem, but nevertheless, there is uh, that process in train. On the other uh, side, then, there is the nuclear uh, arsenal and what we do about the North Korean nuclear arsenal. I, I guess, take a long view of this in some ways because I think the best way to get at it is a phased approach. We started this uh, some time ago uh, in the old days with things like shutting down the Yongbyon reactor and stopping their ability to produce fissile material. You know, we, we can, again, I think, think about some phases to pursue with them. And uh, that is how I go about it. I would go about it. But with phases, that presumes that then you do have a kind of step by step. And they have to take some steps. We have to take some steps. Uh, I frankly have never found it very effective to negotiate on an all or nothing basis. And so I will just leave it at that. Thanks. Let me turn to all of you. If you just raise your hand, wait for the microphone, identify yourself, please be concise and remember to end with a question mark. Yes, ma'am. Mike's, Mike's right behind you. Hi, good morning. Amy Nelson, National Defense University. Rose, thank you so much for your comments. It's always wonderful hearing um, how you see these issues and how you contextualize them. I wanted to back up to, the, to what you were just speaking about, about China coming to the negotiation table. What do you think would effectively incentivize China into trilateral arms control? And given your experience negotiating treaties, what are some of the unique challenges trilateral arms control negotiations might present? I think uh, it's my experience has been, and certainly this was a great revelation for me going to NATO. You know, many of you know me. I've spent most of my career working on bilateral matters with the Soviet Union and Russia, and particularly in the nuclear realm. Suddenly to have to deal with 29 allies on a day-in, day-out basis, my um, 
my admiration is abundant for those of you who have made your career on multilateral diplomacy. So I will just uh, pay that compliment right up, right up front. But uh, I do think that it is uh, that it is very possible. What I don't think is possible is structuring a negotiation on their strategic forces. They are just too small compared to the U.S. and Russian uh, forces. We have 1,550 deployed warheads, each of us, then with some in storage. The last time U.S. Uh, warhead numbers were made public, they were you know, around 4,000 total. China's down below 500. I just don't see how you structure a strategic negotiation with them unless you're urging them to rush rush to parity. And I don't think any of us want to urge them to rush to parity. So that's the basic conundrum there. And that's why I say we need to uh, go through the door of the intermediate range ground launch <coughs> systems and place constraints there because their uh, numbers are, you know, there's some equivalence. There, there are common uh, stability threats, the threat of short warning or no warning attack on critical targets, especially command and control targets. They are consistent since, you know, Russians, uh, the Soviet Union and U.S. woke up to this in the 1980s, short warning attack on command and control decapitation strikes. So these same conundrums, these same difficulties affect all of those across Eurasia who deploy these. And that's the basic conundrum that in the end will, I think, inform an incentivization process to get countries to come to the table. But it takes, again, phases of discussion. You start by talking about what this threat is. You talk about the history. You begin to get, it's a kind of strategic stability dialogue to begin with. And then afterwards, you can move to discussion of restraint measures and transparency measures. They're never enough. Uh, unilateral statements are never enough in the arms control world. But you move through these phases to get to the structuring of an actual control and limitation regime. So that is how I would go about it. It's a long game. Maybe it's not satisfying. But I would really uh, think that given the history we've had with the P5 um, process over the last 10 years, I think there's been a certain maturation already in the relationship among the P5 to, to begin such a, such a process. You could do it in the P5 context. You could do it in, on a trilateral basis. Thanks. Let me look in the back, way in the back. He's just right on the aisle. Uh -huh. My name is David Loudon. I'm a policy analyst. Um, Ma'am, I'm wondering if uh, I, I appreciate the comment about the drone deployment. And, and hopefully that will evolve into more locations. What I wanted to ask is, does that fall under the umbrella of open skies? Oh, the, uh, no, the long-term, um, long, the long-range uh, surveillance drone that NATO has deployed in Sicily is part of a, a you know, a long-range program that is a NATO program per se. It is not part of the uh, OST, the Open Skies Treaty. Those capabilities are, are quite defined. They are aircraft that are agreed among all the parties uh, to, uh, to be used on open skies flights. The US aircraft are very old, uh, and they need replacement. I actually have understood that the Air Force has put money for replacement planes as well as, as cameras and uh, other equipment into their budget. And I hope that can move forward, because let me just say a word about open skies, because it has been um, under criticism and, and some threat, but I see it as enormously valuable to providing confidence building and predictability in, in Europe. Of course, the US has much more capable, much more capable national technical means, satellites, et cetera, et cetera. But the benefits of these open skies flights uh, is that all open skies uh, treaty member states, including uh, 27 of 29 NATO allies are members of the Open Skies Treaty. Many of them do not have NPM. It's their way to get uh, good surveillance information and also to participate in the process as well. And finally, it's been really important to address some of the, uh, some of the, the really difficult situations that have, have uh, flowed from the clashes between Russia and Ukraine. I refer you to the Sea of Azov incident a year ago in November. And after that happened, uh, we used open skies flights uh, flying over the territory of Ukraine, 
but in essentially to convey some strong messages to Russia about the unacceptability of their behavior. So it's also an important diplomacy and signaling mechanism that's very, very important to the Allies. So I really, uh, I really see a huge amount of value to Open Skies. It's, uh, from my way of thinking, it's, uh, it's a very um, cheap way to go about additional stability, predictability, and as I said, these important diplomatic tools. We have time for two last questions. Let me, yes, ma'am. Microphone's right behind you. Thank you. Um, I'm Julia from Sound of Hope Radio Network. My question is, Mr. Stoltenberg said uh, NATO believe 5G technology will be still build, building block of society and is extremely important as it will affect all works of life, industry, communications, security in a much more fundamental way. We heard that some of countries in Europe plan to accept Huawei's facilities, which some experts said is still can capture the data and information. So in your way, in your will, how to help those countries avoid of working with Huawei for security? Thank you. Well, I'll speak from the perspective of the NATO alliance. Industrial policy, no matter what it is, is determined by individual NATO member states. So NATO per se does not have a policy with regard to any particular uh, industrial choices that NATO members might, might make. In the case of, of Huawei, allies differ on this matter. And there is a, a vigorous discussion uh, among uh, NATO member states as to what the, the threats are that may ensue from, from uh, purchasing and making use of, of 5G technology uh, that would be constructed by Huawei. So I don't want to opine on this matter further, but I do take note of the fact that uh, this was part of the discussions in, in London. It will continue to be an issue that is addressed at, at a high level, I'm sure. Bringing 5G technology into our societies and our countries is going to be high on the priority list of, of uh, all the governments who are member states of NATO. So I know it's going to continue to be a hot issue, but it's, uh, it's not one, uh, frankly, where consensus can be reached easily. It will, take, it will take some time. It will take some discussion. And uh, there will clearly be, I think, some, uh, some further steps along, along the way. From a NATO perspective, I'll just say, just, I'm talking about the NATO institution. Uh, we, you know, make our decisions and really focus on trying to purchase from, from NATO member states uh, equipment and, and so forth that we need. Sometimes that's possible, sometimes that's not possible. One last question. Ken. Thank you, Rose. Very, Ken Yellow, it's Rose. Thank you very much, and also, Ray, for your uh, wonderful service. Could I go back to uh, Russia for just a moment? Um, Russia has an economy that is stagnating. Uh, it has demographic problems. It has health issues. Um, it's, it's already deeply engaged in Syria and Ukraine. Um, there are a variety of, of signs that are very interesting internally. There was a poll uh, that showed that 18 to 24-year-old young Russians, half of them wish to leave the country. Uh, this is a country, you know, that's obviously very important. And yet, you know, we, you know, we're coming into a situation now with Iran, uh, with North Korea, and also the START Treaty that is up for renewal. My question is, you talked about the need, you know, for deterrence and also dialogue. Are NATO and the United States gearing up for this type of a necessary dialogue with a Russia, you know, that is changing, that is both declining and dangerous, you know, at the same time? Uh, are we up to this in this coming year? Because uh, it seems that you know we have very few level, levels of interaction anymore. And what would you recommend? Well, I took note with interest that President uh, Trump said as he was in London uh, that he and President Putin have been talking about a new <coughs> nuclear arms agreement and uh, seems rather enthusiastic. Maybe China now, maybe China later was also part of of Mr. Trump's remarks, but he clearly has an interest, and I think from what I've heard President Putin say, he has an interest in, in carrying forward uh, some further nuclear arms agreement. I think this is a good thing. Uh, the, they were, 
going back uh, to the period uh, of the uh, early 1970s, the nuclear arms uh, treaties, by the way, both the ABM treaty, but also the first strategic arms limitation treaty, they kind of led the way in, in driving some progress in other areas, including scientific cooperation in those days and, and space cooperation, early space cooper cooperation in those days. So I, you know, just from my own career experience, I've always thought of, of um, the nuclear arms limitation and reduction agreements as being a kind of leading edge for perhaps some further cooperation. We can't get around the fact, Ken, though, that the Russians seized Ukrainian territory and have been destabilizing the Donbass. That is still a basic constraint on the kind of wide-ranging cooperation that I think we all hoped for. I mentioned in my remarks that there was a long period uh, from the 1990s until really the, the invasion of of uh, Crimea when we thought somehow we could draw Russia and NATO closer together and have a, and we did do some wide-ranging projects together. We worked on things like like uh, uh, counterterrorism. We worked on uh, counter narcotics in Central Asia. We did work effectively together in, in some very pragmatic ways, but at the moment it's difficult to foresee how to, how to get beyond that basic fact unless, as I said, there is some true progress on settling the situation in the Donbass, and then I could see uh, the aperture beginning to open for, for further cooperation between, uh, at least between NATO and Russia. Now, the United States, it's a different matter. I, I cannot comment further uh, beyond what uh, I heard from President Trump, I, uh, and clearly there have been many and wide-ranging constraints about Russian behavior with regard to U.S. elections and so forth, so there are some I would say some uh, some factors pushing in the other direction, so um, I cannot uh, really say further where where I think things are going to go. But I do hope, on the basis not only of my uh, my career preferences, but also on the basis of uh, the fact that I think it would be good for for global security if if there could be some progress on the nuclear arms control front. Rose, on, on all of our behalf, I want to thank you not just for the thoughtfulness of your remarks today, but for reminding all of us why we were so lucky to have you in U.S. public service for so many years, your service at NATO, and why we all hope so much we'll continue to hear your wise voice in the years ahead. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. That was great. Thank, thank you. you. It's so nice to see you. How are you? I'm fine. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you.